Good evening and thank you for joining us. This evening we have artist Tony Arrico who will be providing a lecture on his work and his artistic practice. This lecture is presented in association with the exhibition I curated titled This Mortal Coil, which remains on view at the Zuckerman Museum of Art through December 11th. Tony Arrico is a visual and performance artist, choreographer, and a dancer. Merging the act of drawing with choreographic gesture and biogeometrics, his work has reached mass circulation for its ingenuity within the intersections of performance and drawing. His work explores how consciousness and physical impulses manifest into visible forms. He often uses his own somatic research, suspension practice, as point of entry into his visual work. He has performed and exhibited his work across the United States and internationally, including in Australia, Belgium, China, Denmark, France, Germany, Greece, and Mexico. His visual work is in the collection of the National Academy of Sciences in Washington, DC, and the Museo Universitatio de Arte Contemporaneo in Mexico City, as well as prominent private collections. He has presented at the New Museum, the Cranbrook Art Museum and Pop Tech 2011, The World Rebalancing. Tony Arrico was one of a select group of artists to re-perform the work of Marina Abramovic during her retrospective at MoMA in 2010. As a former member of Trisha Brown Dance Company and Shenway Dance Arts, Arrico has graced such stages as the Sydney Opera House, the Teatro La Fenice, the New York State Theater, and the Theater du Palais Royal. Please join me in welcoming Tony. I am going to go into pretty great detail about my um, movement practice, which informs uh, almost all of my visual work. So I'll spend about half the talk um, talking about that evolution. And then the other half, uh, I'll show some, some slides and video. This is Penwald 4 Unison Symmetry Standing. I created it in 2010. So on the first day, I'm in the left hand circle and my right hand is dominant and my left hand is uh, instantly mirroring the action. So I think of the right hand as being uh, choice making. I draw for four hours and time is called. And on the second day, at the same time, I start again for four hours, uh, drawing in the right hand circle. My left hand is dominant or decision making and my right hand is instantly mirroring the action. So it appears to be in unison and in symmetry. And on the third day, I'm in the center circle where I'm experiencing non-dominance. So all the movement is informed by uh, the environment and what's felt in the body. I also uh, invite myself to bend my knees and rise to toes to break the form. Stop. And time is called. 
So here's an installation of the drawing you just experienced and another drawing of mine, uh, Eight Circles, in 2010 in Eindhoven at a festival. In my work, I'm considering consciousness as viscous medium, that um, being different than the conventions of drawing, where um, there's a lot of hand-eye coordination. And um, what we're drawing tends to be a representation of imagery in, that's constructed in the mind. In my work, I feel the coordination is between uh, a conscious body and trying to sustain that, and the point of transfer. The focus is on the friction in between and maintaining what I feel is like the state of genesis and staying in that space. I want to read a little bit of an artistic statement from the past. I commit my attention rationally to the sensitivity of my body at the receptive le level, ready points and lines and space. I attain a sense of embodiment that is geometric and mechanical, with no dominating sense of axis or directional force. I find the ability to motor from invented traction. The course is non-objective. It's a continuation of pathway and response to stimuli. I've always loved this image of Eve Klein's uh, leap into the void. Uh, it really, for me, represents um, the sort of beginning of this evolution of practice for me. And that starts in 2005 when I started practicing the simulation of falling and the sensation of falling in space. And just to give you a little context, um, at that time I was dancing professionally a few years into um, my career and I was studying the fundamentals of Chinese opera with uh, choreographer Shen Wei, who I was working with. I was just beginning to learn a little bit about breath-centered yoga and meditation, and I had some early notions about uh, somatic practices and their relationship to dance. I was also a painter through my youth. Um, I was translating a lot of what I was working out in the studio in process, uh, these kind of choreographic structures, through painting and painting experientially, kind of seeing myself as, as navigating through the moving brush or the line. I also had a lot of anxiety and um, some major issues, um, mainly with my uh, cervical spine. For eight years, I had a an issue where my jaw would just spontaneously dislocate. So it would uh, dislocate on one side, come out of its socket, and get stuck all the way open, like chin against chest. Um, it started the year I started dancing. So I think I had something else going on. And then with all the training and all that effort, it was just really aggravating the conditions. And this would happen to me for anywhere from a few minutes to a few hours, and many times for a few days. My first, when I first moved to New York, uh, that first weekend, I sat in my room with my face open for three days and uh, checked myself into the hospital. It's kind of like Edward Monk's scream face. And I laugh about it now, but obviously it was pretty disturbing. I sampled um, many interventions and uh, eventually committed to this moment of lying on my back and simulating the sensation of falling through the floor. And it, over time, and not that much time, started to really reverse the conditions of my jaw. That discovery completely influenced the trajectory of the rest of my life and my creative work. And it became the basis for my embodied practice, and I call that suspension. So I do want to share the full story of how that practice evolved, and I apologize ahead of time for the density. But I will arrive to um, the consideration of how receptivity uh, works for me inside of performance, the, the topic of my talk here. This is an image I often think about, uh, I guess since 96, uh, from train spotting. This idea of a simulation of falling, um, that I experience the body as having one impression in the floor, lying supine. The whole outline of the body, feeling the pressure, the connection of my bones, my muscles to the floor, one mass falling through one impression. And in the beginning, I would feel a lot of torque. And so after simulate, simulating this for many hours, I could feel myself kind of falling over one shoulder or around one hip or feet before head and was curious about how to stabilize that sensation. One substance, one pressure, one mass or density, softening, releasing, stabilizing, 
And I came to find that it seemed to be where memory of the action resided, in the joints, and I call those the gateways, that allowed me to really stabilize the pressure, really releasing where all the joints were in the body. And in that space, I noticed a lot of reflex in my breath, go from smooth to abrupt to shallow, twitching in my muscles, expanding, contracting, shifting in my body temperature, sudden moments of physical, emotional release, uh, moments that were really profound. And so the next level was um, learning how to kind of accelerate and sustain this activity. I was going kind of deeper into the practice. And at times it sort of was inducing this, what felt like vertigo, um, this larger than life feeling across my body. I could feel gravity and I could feel gravity's pull on the body. And I also started to develop the ability to kind of increase acceleration, to fall more. Um, it would cause this kind of disorientation to space around me but over time, my body would acclimate to the conditions and I would have these extended moments of, of, of major relief. This um, disassociation to the force beneath my body and this sense of weightlessness. And in terms of effort, it was a really uh, kind of nuanced experience. And so I have this image here because I often reference uh, Olympic curling because um, I'm just so curious about the activity in that sport, this kind of warming around the movement or direction of the puck, or in my case, of something, this direction I wasn't sure where I was going, but I was energetically kind of guiding the aim. And one of the key principles for me uh, right away became that the attention had to be toward arrival and not departure, that departure was kind of quitting energy and that arrival kind of kept me um, in the game, even though it ebbed and flowed. And also to consider any residual action in my body as just being mysterious and being in support of or nurturing that continued arrival. So this image for me, um, just a sketch I made of just kind of a, a random um, like history of sensation in the body and then the outlining of the form. And when I was observing sensation, I kind of categorized it in two ways where there were isolated sensations in the body, which was more of a disintegrated experience falling through the impression of my body through the floor or more of a unified form, an integrated experience of the whole body falling through the impression in the floor. And this is the first sort of relationship that I established. What became paramount to my development at that moment was that it was always relational, that, attention, that my attention stayed directed, but that it was divided into two experiences at least that were crossed and forming each other. And so over time, as you see, I have a few um, things that come into, the, in, into play. Um, it's almost like a full menu, and I'm in this space of like choiceless selection where, oh, these two things are in play, or these two things, or these three things are now in play. And so it gives me sort of a lot of option to move through without really choosing. Without relationship, there would be no impetus to generate the momentum. I was also deciphering how I was perceiving sensation. Instead of imaging, what I wanted it to be, so this kind of cognitive experience or working through simile or metaphor or you know, other tools of conveyance, like the body, I'm picturing myself as something. I came up with this uh, term and I started to term a lot of what I was experiencing to collect my ideas. Um, the term felt picture, that it was sensation based, this illumination that was felt and um, it's kind of like flexing my proprioceptive uh, faculty. So anything that kind of comes into the picture of what's felt without imaging it in my mind. And so next level is um, this uh, term I call axial expansion. Um, uh, kind of opening up a relationship, a perpendicular relationship to space. And so I would kind of start labeling this as more field-centric simulation, simulating um, something for the body that's in relationship to space and shifting the simulation of falling onto other axes. So not just backward and forward, but up and down or side and side. In a practical sense, I was still using gravity and the given plane beneath my body as a point of reference. But there was this notion that sensation is used to being accompanied by gravity. And the acceleration of falling could match the acceleration of gravity's pull on my body and that I could achieve this state of weightlessness and create more of a sort of energetic mobility 
in the body that's um, in opposing directions at the same time. So in a creative sense, I was generating new directional force. You can kind of choose the plane, choose the direction of falling. And so more of just flexing this proprioceptive ability, um, I kind of deduced it down to an activity that was easy to recall, which was just to, from, and with. Falling to, falling from, or simultaneously to and from being with oppositional direction. So this requires first um, a lot of suspension of disbelief, <laughs> um, but then the ability to really develop and sense it. And so first I was sensing where sensation was, so the trajectory of it from falling, that there's this spatial memory, that if we feel something in the body, it's remembered in the body, but we can also leave the memory in space if we're moving away from it. So this idea of trajectory, but also where it currently is. So noticing what sensation is in the body currently, and then also where it could be. So this idea of projection, being able to cast sensation spatially in another direction. So there it's creative or generative. But if you project sensation to be a distance away from the body, it causes um, kind of a shift of pressure in the body. And so that became kind of my evidence that this was different than that. <laughs> So that image again, just a random kind of history of sensation in the body or current sensation in the body, um, that it's not constant, that it's not achieving these kind of constant levels, but they're just glimpses of what comes in the felt picture and um, what's arriving. And this idea of working with axial susp suspension, I did this just simple drawing exercise with the same form using an eraser and ruler. working with X, Y, Z coordinates um, visually here to show this kind of sp spatial smear or dissipation of energy in the body. And this is a sculpture that can be activated that I created here during my residency. Um, it's uh, called didactic, uh, so a learning tool for axial expansion. This is something that I've wanted to make for 15 years of my life. Um, and uh, this is the kinds of um, sort of uh, freedom um, that a residency like this provides. I'm working out all of these didactics and making a lot of new work now, and it's a really exciting uh, opportunity. This um, sculpture can kind of represent a full integrated body as one form or an isolated patch of sensation on the body. And that center piece of wood in the middle uh, would be representative of the body. It's a little bit sideways. You can kind of imagine this up down. And then the ropes are the sensation passing through. So it would begin collapsed and the ropes would be kind of a s scattered and this would be like an unruly cluster of sort of sensation or energy or history in the body. And then when the boards are dropped, sensation is energetically elongated and organized. The memory of the sensation is cast in front of the body. And then through acceleration and learning how to sustain the acceleration, there's that acclimation that I was talking about this disassociation with the given plane, which could be the board beneath there, and directional force. And then the simulation kind of move into falling upward, that spatial planes could populate beneath the body as well. So that's how the body's floating in the center. The ropes beneath the body are projections of sensation where sensation could be. And so I kind of describe this as energetic mobility, this slippage um, in two directions and that it can be exercised spatially in three different ways. I never realized how much falling feels like not falling. Huh? So I never realized how much falling feels like not falling. I was watching cartoons with my son and when this came up, I, I swore I was dreaming and it was like this subliminal message just for me. <laughs> he was looking at me. Um, but I just, I, I remember a moment in my life where I was thinking about um, like how one stable vantage point, watching the trajectory of, of um, a moving object or a moving image, how it enters and leaves the frame. But when one stable vantage point is moving with the trajectory of an object, it really centralizes the image and the experience stays within the frame. And this marks a pretty important moment for me where my simulation and my experience inside of this um, became really body-centric. So this idea of inside falling, where there were glimpses of no felt direction between falling, no felt distinction between falling to a direction and being with all directions at the same time. 
where the body becomes the center of space. Body-centric simulations, this idea where I started manifesting sensation on my body um, beyond what was just there already and illuminating new sensation. And for me, this started to feel like drawing on my body. Another fun one in the memory bank, Kill Bill. Uma is experiencing full body paralysis and saying, move your big toe. Um, this, uh, for me, kind of represents this idea of activation, this sort of first um, uh, body-centric simulation that I was experiencing, bringing sensation into felt picture. There's an effort to locate sensation along the topography of the body, where the threshold between inner and outer space is. And to source practically, so using this idea of falling or a small drop, um, right beneath the desired sensation as the impetus for its mobility. And so I called that, I started calling that kind of the micro collapse, that I could, you know, feel that in the whole impression of the body, but also just beneath the sensation, these relational, integrated, disintegrated. Um, this could begin with uh, what sensations were present, and I started um, kind of developing this idea of training crawling over the surface of the skin, which is a really more isolated um, sensation experience, and then move, moving into more broader movements, um, kind of a migration of a fuller patch of sensation, so working in both of those ways. And in order to instigate that, I could resource from what was given, the way the clothing felt on the body, the flow of air around my body, the temperature, moisture, bone density, the protuberances of bones underneath the surface of the skin kind of pressing back, or physical contact with the floor or stacking of the body. And I would realize that there were these voids of sensation that I kind of just called gray space. And I could continually source from what was practical, this idea of a, a micro collapse just beneath in order to wake up the gray space and kind of continue to either to move the, the single sensation or to move a whole patch of sensations across the body. And so in terms of drawing, it's kind of like how there's points if we could actually isolate a sensation that eventually create lines. And, and in relationship to the body, that could be, be considered as folds in the body. And that lines that are indirect become contours, kind of that um, eventually close out full shape along the surface of the body. And I call those palettes. And then thinking about how palettes can be integrated and work and operate together, I started labeling palettes as being either soft or hard palette, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then eventually, so kind of reconstructing the body, this idea of the whole unified form of the body coming to be. So a little illustration of where point, line, contour, palette might be found or felt on the body. And similar to how I was waking up space in the field, centric simulation with the body, I was working with perpendicularity, um, using, using this to activate points and lines across the body. And so this is the orientation to the body and not space. The grid is sort of felt on the body and perpendicularity um, it becomes relational to folds and edges and centers of palettes along the body so that the reference is located on the body. I would use this to continuously affirm the center of a sensation. And I also use it to expand folds, lines, affirm sensation within the folds. So these images of an exercise that I call both parting and narrowing, so waking up this kind of inverse relationship. The idea of parting, like how when we're parting our hair very meticulously, you kind of move a little bit left, a little bit right, trying to affirm center. And then the idea of narrowing being like the convergence of two waterfalls, kind of pouring into the fold, into center. And that they have this inverse effect that when we're narrowing, it sort of widens the surrounding field. And when we're parting to find sensation along a line or fold, it sort of makes the center field more finite. You can feel the sensation in a crawling fashion kind of moving in order to affirm and separating to affirm or falling into center to affirm. And some, some examples of center points that I, I work with in perpendicularity, they're um, near the spine and joints where action resides. But it can be used anywhere just to support activation in order to kind of move sensation along the surface. You can see how some of the lines bisect um, palettes of the body. And this would, for me, in a more functional way, supports efficiency in the structure of my body, how palettes articulate, being able to locate um, where the joints, where the folds and the joints are 
and to start to integrate the full form through what's felt. And so here the soft palette is represented by yellow and the hard palette is represented by orange. Um, that the idea that you can, in a more broad way, uh, activate a full palette in the body. The uh, soft palette being more belly-like surface area and hard palette being more rigid, kind of container-like. So just looking at a single point, one sensation if we could, isolate it. Um, the activation of it is kind of the down to go up. Right? And this is the impetus to, to kind of stir up activity that generates more of a sense of suspension, which is what I call my practice, more of the space that I'm trying to attain. Um, suspension could be thought of as being um, sort of oblique expansion, so relating to all planes at once, which sounds super sci-fi, but um, you can kind of just think about it energetically. Um, being kind of centrifugal and centripetal at the same time, so that center is fleeing kind of moving away from center to a firm center, or center is seeking, moving inward to a firm outward. And this is how, um, where points start to be felt as being spherical or lines as cylindrical, palette or the full form of the body having a lot of vol volume. And so what I, was, what, I, what I do is organize the sensation to create an accountability toward mapping and navigating the full terrain of my body in uh, real time and to work with a, what, what is arriving and what's there to manifest more of it and that anything felt can be both seeking and fleeing center at the same time, you create a kind of a, a level of spaciousness around the sensation. And so we're getting really close to drawing here. <laughs> the idea of co-planing um, is connecting stimuli to the body in real time. And so I borrow that term from geometry, this idea that Three points can create a line, but or three points that aren't in a line um, would create a plane in space that are coplanar. In 2011, I wrote, the idea is to make use of dynamic environment, passing sound, light, movement, as well as what's being sensed within, breath, sensation, thoughts, to stabilize the body's relationship to planar surfaces and space. Through distance, I sense a fluid rhythm of invisible vectors that connect mirrored sensations along my body to the apices of surrounding stimuli. Assuming that the distant points of these virtual geometries can be energetically weighted, I generate peripheral force to use as leverage, continually calibrating my body in newfound space. And so I just labeled them with numbers here, but you can kind of imagine your own assignments. But if you imagine a clap or a cough in space while I'm performing, or um, a pain in the body, or a judgment in my mental space, or a drop of perspiration down my back, or a breeze around an ankle, the outer edge of a knee mirroring the outer edge of the other knee, an insect crawling on the wall, anything that comes in as a stimulus to the experience is transferred um, through the body. So the stimulus, in, the stimulus instigates the action. There's ease in my alignment and my openness at the gates. The body is one pressure. The stimuli connect to sensations that are currently in felt picture and they're instantly mirrored across the body. Prolonged by suspension, this awakening, this ability, this continuation, the full form is falling through the impression of my feet. And then leverage for the action of drawing, doing, or making something, feeling that leverage from the ground back up. And in this case, in drawing, into the wall. If you can imagine two graphite sticks against the wall, monitoring the pressure into the wall, and then balancing that hemispherically between the left hand and the right hand, trying to balance the pressure. And just noticing the vibration of those two rolling frictions. And so it's just keeping that feedback loop going of bringing in a stimulus, grounding it back up into the wall, balancing pressure forward, left and right, hemispherically in the body. So I'm going to share some of my work now, and not in a chronological order necessarily, but more um, the evolution of it kind of conceptually. Um, this uh, piece that you saw was 2010. This is an image from in, um, at Starry Brovar Art Center in 2014. Uh, each of my works I create uh, eight impressions of in my lifetime, and I kind of established it that way intentionally 
to experiencing uh, my aging body in relationship to kind of an increased sense of, of will and determination. And um, each of the performances that are um, charged by a unique audience and uh, unique spaces. So my work is unpracticed. What's practiced is my body. And so I don't practice these ideas in the studio. I only revisit them live. And there's an installation at Cranbrook Museum and a detail. Penwald One Circle, Penwald One One Circle 2009. This is an impression I did in the studio. So some of them are studio impressions, at least the first ones. Um, and it's on four panels. Uh, this piece takes 20 minutes and there are 1,000 strokes. The way that I determine how, to, how my work ends um, are in three different ways. It's either visual, where it's the right amount of density, where the image isn't um, over underexposed, and that I can really see through the layers of effort and time. And so that's why I decided to stop after 11 strokes here. Otherwise, it's when I complete a structural logic. So it could be the number of revolutions in the, in the form or something that informs um, an endpoint. And then lastly, it could be by the will of my body when I'm just fully exhausted, that's the end of that piece. Here's Penwald 7, uh, four three quarter turns left and the title um, explains itself. I do a three quarter turn um, lying prone to the ground, drawing with my arms in um, full extension to the side, repeating the same gesture. And then I roll over and do another three quarter turn and come back home. This takes uh, approximately 10 minutes and a detail of the center. Penwalt 2, Eight Circles, Eight Gestures was made in 2009 and is ongoing, so all of my work in Penwald series is ongoing. This is at the National Academy of Sciences. It takes approximately three hours to perform um, Eight Circles, Eight Gestures. I have another iteration that came first of just Eight Circles, which I describe as just being my home circle eight times. So I make eight circles, I circumnavigate on my belly one circle and roll over and then come all the way around eight laps, eight circles, eight laps. In uh, the catalog convergence of um, the art collection of the National Academy of Sciences, um, there's a, a nice uh, illustration of my drawing. Um, the, the mural on the top of the National Academy of Sciences dome in the Great Hall is um, a mural by Hildreth Meir from uh, Art Deco era. Um, and it's the depiction of the eight sciences. And in the center, the inscription is quite nice. It says, ages and cycles of nature in ceaseless sequence moving. And so when I was invited and I found um, that relationship and, and really the size of it is quite similar to my drawing, um, that's when I switched from just doing the same circle into eight different gestures. And I extracted forms from each of those medallions. So anthropology is the home circle, interdependence. Geology, the shape of a trilobite fossil. Chemistry, a scale. Astro astronomy, infinite, infinity symbol. Physics, magnets, mathematics, triangle. Botany, pea pods. Zoology, starfish. When I first performed this piece, um, I didn't suspect that I would come all the way around. I didn't know what I was really exploring. Um, but when, you, when I roll over, because the, ankle, the hips are wider than the ankles, it's slightly skew. And at least to my dimensions, um, brings me back home all the way around. It's at the CCCB in Barcelona. This is at MWAC, the Contemporary Art Museum in Mexico City. They, um, I had a solo exhibition there with the acquisition of this work and another work.
starfish. <laughs> After three hours, I'm really used to living that way on the ground that it's quite difficult to stand up. This is at Center Pompidou in Metz and at uh, UB Art Gallery in Buffalo. And on the floor, I'm um, performing uh, Prone to Stand. Uh, but I just want to briefly say that with, with the Penwald work, um, I see these as conceptual scores where the, my body kind of holds the master of the score. Um, and it really is, it's an incredible feeling coming back to work after years of being outside of it. Um, there's a lot of mystery, um, a little bit of fear, um, reapproaching these works, um, understanding the endurance and not having experienced that for so much time. And at this point in my life, I've had years turn over where I've kind of come back to these works. And at first it's really disorienting. And then I just, you know, there's enough time and space to really land in it and really delve into it. And it really feels like a homecoming. This is Prone to Stand, uh, 2011. There are three levels to standing, and each takes one hour. And there's a caller who says, change. At first, I'm lying prone, facing down, working with unison symmetry uh, at the, in the span of my arms. And then I come back to my knees onto the crown of my head, and I'm able to roll the crown of my head forward and backward. And then I come to a hunker, uh, or a squat, and a forward fold. And then I stand to finish. And for me, it's really kind of reflective of the de developmental stages of, of human learning, kind of from belly to traversing land. Uh, wrists on walk is 90 minutes and in three stages. Uh, I'm seated in a chair at a table, and um, I kind of, I called it wrists on walk with a little shout out to Martha Graham, who has a fourth position on the walk where the toes are <laughs> ready to go. Um, but then my hands are on the walk, and so I'm filling within the span of my hands, pivoting from the wrist, passing the graphite between my fingers, and my wrists walk one step out, and my fingertips forward again. And then I fill again, it takes me out of my chair, and then on the next walk, my arms are wider. And here I'm hunkered right over the table, just kind of hovering over the table, and then the last bit is just to prove that the, my wingspan is finished, and then the piece is over. It's one of my earlier pieces where you really see how the body starts to become kind of a smudging tool, that there's a lot of um, sort of depth in the piece from, from that. One of my earlier pieces, Penwald Three Circle on Knees, 2011. I'm using the pendular swing of my arms to strike the surface of the paper while I'm kneeling and rotating on my knees. And it's a nice effect where the, there's kind of a um, bounce in the graphite. So it's kind of like hit, pull, hit, pull, hit, pull. And, and it's also very audible. There's a nice rhythm. And there's a detail. The sheen in real life of the graphite is pretty nice because there's so, so much denting in the paper. And here is... Um, the last of my, in my series, this is the eighth drawing of eight that I completed here at the Stanley Museum for the groundbreaking ceremony. Um, the um, idea is that I'm, uh, I rotate twice around the circle. The next two laps, I trace the outer rim with my knees. The next two laps, I trace the inner rim with my knees, and this loads up my knees and my toes with uh, a lot of graphite. And then the last two circles, I come back to the center and the, um, there's a lot of smudging with the feet and the knees that creates kind of a halo effect. Penwald 8, 12 by 12 on knees. So I keep going in that direction into a larger iteration. This is 144 knee circles. Each one is a single revolution and it takes uh, approximately four hours to complete. Um, one of my performances at um, Munal in Mexico City. 
And some notes that I found just recently that were pretty exciting to find, and it's good to know where they are because I should sure will need them again. <laughs> um, it's a really complicated and challenging piece to re-enter. Um, I really do have to kind of grid the um, output of the circles and practice it in a, in a hand-drawn way ahead of time. When you're inside the piece and you're belly down, you really can't see any sense of an aerial view to get the alignment of things right. And although I do want to just kind of rely on my body, there is, you know, kind of little degrees of inching in order to really make the piece accurate. Um, there's uh, oftentimes where when I sit up, I'm kind of in just uh, open kind of white paper and I have to trust that where I'm planting that circle is going to be the key to guide an upcoming set of circles in the future. And so um, anticipating that is, is quite tough. I enjoy that this incorporates um, the larger circle drawing using the span of my arms from other work, like a radial dial. And then my discovery in this in why I created the piece is that 12 knee circles um, just perfectly fit inside of that dial. And there's a lot of number patterns where I have to count the circles as I pass them and I use my two arms as kind of a survey tool to keep track of the count so I know how many revolutions I've done before I draw back. Because drawing back I can't see where the circle is going to be placed. And it's that moment where I really extend through my body and I can relieve pressure, compression in my knees. I insert one full cycle of breath and that's my pace keeper. It kind of keeps the piece around the same time but also helps me um, complete it. Um, this is called Lateral Bends Lost. It's a three hour work where I'm drawing in unison symmetry um, and I call it just kind of a color, um, a, a, colorization of the span of my arms, but I allow lateral bending to the left and to the right. And so it's called lateral bends lost because that internal symmetry is lost due to the bending. 90 minutes, project recoil, projecting from the wall and recoiling on my forearms and marking each distance of achievement. at a gallery in Amsterdam in 2011. Waning, 2012. It's approximately 40 minutes. I stand at the wall in four different orientations. So first facing, then profile, then facing out, and then profile in the other direction. And I'm tracing the full contour of my body, stopping at any folds. And when I stop at a fold, I allow all of the life out of the body. So all of the breath, all of the muscularity where it just comes into kind of an instant stacking of the architecture of the body and then a projection of it away. I'm working with two graphite sticks, so there's the outlining whatever arm's available and the other one just anchors to the wall. This is at Hyde Park Art Center in 2013. The next stage is um, 
a coloring of the skeleton of the action. So it's a treatment that I do in the studio. And I use both hands to color, um, alternating between strong pressure and light pressure per hand. So they both have their own assignment going. And for me, it's a, a transformation into a landmass or a burial of the action, kind of turning it into sediment. An installation view at Marceau Gallery and another one at PPOW. And so I just really like in the coloration how the body can be found when you're up close to this drawing. You can see all these energy lines falling from it. Passing Light in 2012. This was um, an invitation to Mnall um, to do an intervention with um, the museum. And I chose to kind of respond to the architecture and attempt to uh, capture the part of design that is ephemeral, the way that light moves through a building. So here's one of the finished pieces. But the task is to wait for the light to hit the paper and then to shade where the light is. And when all current light is colored in, then I erase everything. And I repeat this where the current light is. And I continue until the light actually fully leaves the paper. And so it kind of leaves me sometimes with some shapes if the light, while I'm in the process of erasing, is gone. Drumming over my head until my arms fully succumb to gravity. You just get the stain of the action. And this takes approximately three and a half hours. Every time I've performed the piece, it, it lands just a few minutes. It's just one action, and um, I didn't suspect that. Uh, this is another iteration of this where I return over the course of seven days at the same time each day and just move to the outside of the day before. And the intention was that my arms would just draw or would just fall. I'm kind of parallel to the last days. Um, but what I found is over the course of three and a half hours, it's, it's imperceptible. In, imperceptible. Um, it's, such a, it's such subtle movement over time that the hands just sort of collapse through the center of the body and then release and flush through center. And once the wrists flip, it's a matter of minutes before it's over. There's a darker band through the center. And this is where the arms um, just naturally are kind of stacked, where the elbows are dropped. And I can kind of hang out in that space for um, a lot longer. Seven drum stand. So I'm getting into a series that I call Carbon, which um, the original portion of Carbon were these four performances that were performed on four consecutive nights. Um, the beginning one was Prepare the Plane. I created this in 2012. Um, all of these carbon works are kind of the synthesis of the materials that I tend to use, so paper, body, and graphite. And this series is an ongoing metaphor that eventually leads to the full um, kind of figurative transformation of the body into graphite. I was interested in this time of just this idea of readiness and sustaining a sense of readiness, um, but for all of my materials, and that the presence and vibration of the materials were alive. And so um, the, the, 
the dressing is really just um, dental occlusions or um, imprints of my teeth, so um, bite marks into the paper. I saw this as kind of antagonizing the antagonist, my jaw, um, and using this body practice um, to kind of move through those thresholds of resistance along the way. The piece ends when either the paper is fully chewed or the weight of the paper um, brings me to my back. And in the four times I performed it, three of the times uh, landed around eight hours, um, it brought me to my back. <laughs> the fourth time um, was about eight and a half hours and I chewed the full, um, the full paper. <laughs> Being connected to the paper, it becomes this kind of unbearable extension of my body. It really weighs, weighs down my neck and my back. So after the plane is prepared, uh, there's some, some DNA. <laughs> the idea is to then open the plane. And this is a, a three to four hour performance where I'm standing in front of the, the wall sourcing from my body um, as a resource to open the wall. And so I use nails, um, my nails, saliva, and a lot of pounding um, through two layers of the wall to get through. And on the other side is a box um, that's um, kind of body, the, side, the length and width of my body um, that I collect all of the remains in and lay my clothing. And there's an installation view. And then the third round of that performance is trace is the carcass where once was the body. It's the um, gathering of the material and the clothing and um, I I rub the box, so I kind of call these um, coffins, I rub it with the, the drywall and turn it white and then fill the um, fabric with the remains um, and hand stitch it all, um, just using um, a needle and thread and my teeth. <laughs> so there's an image of the sewn piece. And then the last piece, vessel for governing and conception, delivers a graphite smudged um, coffin as well. Um, this was made in 2012. So years ago, I was explaining to an acupuncturist my experimentation with soft and hard palates, and he said it was quite similar to Chinese medicine's division of the body, which would be these governing and conceptual aspects of the body, the kind of yang and yin of the body, or that the governing is um, kind of protective and it um, relates to male aspect or high frequency. And the conception, the yin, is regenerative, the essence of the body, and relates to the female aspect and um, yin, and that these are complementary channels that feed all of the meridians of the body. This piece is uh, just under three hours, and first is the division of my body in hemispheres, and then in palettes. And then the coloration and transformation. Then I color the box, and then I work through uh, suspending the body, and then a vibrational uh, chanting to warm male and female aspects of the body to finish.
And uh, Suspension Field 2015 is a video work I made, uh, 33 minutes. I did it at a, or I created it at a residency in southern Oaxaca at um, the home and studio of Bosco Sodi, a uh, Mexican uh, sculptor and painter. Um, the idea was to do a score of suspension beneath a long, large run of activated carbon fabric, which has um, really special qualities. It's um, really absorbent. It's the, 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 the porousness of it is like acres of land. And I just love the idea of a fabric being so spacious. Um, the space that this was performed in um, is, um, well, the entire building dwelling was designed by a Japanese architect, Tadao Ando. And um, these are very modular kind of concrete um, panels that build the walls, but there are gaps in between for expansion. And so there's a um, really beautiful cast of light where you're actually facing the ocean and, and um, the beach. So this was shot from three different perspectives. Just interested in this kind of hypergeometric form um, along a plane. That it's both uh, illusory and mundane at the same time. That you can kind of see like, oh, there's a body beneath the sheet. But that um, after a while, it becomes kind of um, hypnotic. And it just looks like this hyper form, like an object on a horizon. The body is both lost and found at times. skip forward for the sake of time here into the kind of highest level you can see how that center line that glow is the uh, outside space just sensing with that sense of kind of micro collapse or drop in the body how it creates that hyper quality of the form skip over this work, but this is a series called Movement Toward Definition, where I allow um, visibility and um, stay on that cusp of where the eyes, when they get engaged in um, kind of move, movement-inspired drawing, um, want to kind of define form and just staying on the cusp of that, of not knowing where it's going, but the form just keeps arriving. And this is some uh, synthesis of some chewing and some graphite smudging. Um, I started working with these specimens of graphite from Sri Lanka that are um, the purest form of graphite you can find. It's like just pure silver. Um, and grinding them to create my own powder and doing these kind of ritualistic smudgings um, over different objects. And this one I just wanted to read a little bit about. Um, it's called Standing Nabi Starfish. I collected the remains of several kinds of organisms that have exoskeletons, contemplating the action that once existed in the soft inner space of these relics. How biological rhythms of nourishment, movement, growth, regeneration yield lasting marks of existence. Despite my body's inverse makeup, I was relating my use of awareness and receptivity to generate new actions to the likeness of these creation, creatures. In our interplay, I experimented with how they might articulate, stack, or share one center, arriving to this image. For me, it really looks like um, kind of an, an arc uh, or a life cycle or the human spine, kind of like rising to standing to dying, or this like resilient base of our human bodies, the spine. This is my uh, series textile. Each one is named after a different memory. But there's a performative process in which um, I lie on my back underneath the paper um, for a long duration and conjure up uh, seven different memories. So I'm kind of really activating the mind. And um, 
just working with association, free association. And it's um, interesting how long it takes because, you know, after I get kind of like four or five memories collected and I'm working with suspension underneath the paper, um, I, um, illuminating sensation on my body to try to kind of reveal the memory, um, then I forget what one was or two or three and I lose them. And so it's just how, how I can eventually collect seven of them before I sit to draw. So then it becomes a studio piece where I write those seven words in the center of the paper, forward in a list, backward, upside down backward, and upside down forward, and I create a tessellation. There, um, my tools are pretty limited. I'm just uh, I'm using a, a small stick and my pencil, so there's a large uh, margin for error. And just the distraction of sitting for, um, I mean, each of these pieces is about 100 hours of, of writing, but I work you know, for several hours at a time. And um, there's just so much distraction that the, like, like memory, they get lost or they kind of cross. Um, and so when I make mistakes, I cross hatch the mistakes out like I'm sewing the edge of a fabric closed. So there's gaps and um, redirections and um, sort of deviation movement that's very fabric-like. Also the drag of my pinky finger when I'm writing creates a smudge so that it creates a little bit of a ripple or, or waviness to the, the look of it. And for me, it's very reminiscent of like indigenous textiles that have fray and deterioration. I started highlighting certain rhythms using um, colored pencil. And they feel like the kind of splicing of, of memory, like a connectum of memory, but just the splicing of it and thinking about how memory fades and mutates over time, the more and more we recall it, or they adhere to each other, groups of memories. So Yvonne Rayner created uh, a piece called Hand Movie in 1966 that was filmed um, by William Davis, and it was filmed in her hospital bed. Uh, she had an undisclosed health uh, issue and uh, made art from the hospital bed um, where they hung a sheet and she did an improvisation with her hand. And this really marks Rayner's foray um, from uh, dance making into uh, making some video work. And so I created an unauthorized physical scoring of Rayner's iconic piece as homage but also as an action, intending to regenerate and perpetuate the image, performance as a visual tessellation. Her hand is autonomous, disembodied, and deciphering its own direction in time and space. There's no relationship to an environment or objects to reference its scale. It appears to be larger than life and centered on its own orientation to itself. I perceive the thinking and doing of her hand as being fully self-contained, an archetype to me an artist hand, a source of pure deliberateness. So the image is no longer a memory to us, but rather we become memories to it. So this is an homage piece. This is my uh, very detailed um, um, organization of the score. And you can see we had, um, so I worked with my partner and fellow uh, Trisha Brown dancer, former company member, Mindy Myers. And we um, learned the six minute improvisation as a rote choreography with impeccable detail. We were interpreting Rayner's right hand movement and then transferring it to our right hands and then cross teaching that to our left hands. We learned it forward in the six minutes that it lasts and also backward in retrograde. So it becomes a 12 minute piece. And the composer, John McGrew, um, you can see the levels of pitch assigned to the identification of each of the appendages, the fingers and the wrist. Um, he uh, made six recordings and, and, and overlaid them um, where he assigned a different key and a different pitch to each of the appendages. So this isn't how the piece is. It's a self-contained piece, but I'm just showing you kind of a fade from what the learning process was like. Taking Rayner's hand, mirroring it, and then you'll see a little bit of our piece. And the original pieces in silence.
So this is the apparatus that we had to build to um, film the piece. The camera is slowly circumnavigating the performance and it's at a really specific rate actually. It's one centimeter per second and we scaled it along the perimeter so that Alex de la Pena who filmed this could um, follow uh, it fluidly. Um, there's a circular pan, there's a compositional round, and the hands are positioned in radial symmetry. So this idea of accelerating force, um, but also kind of the ultimate um, archiving method for choreography, I think, that you get all vantage points at once. Um, it kind of reveals what um, maybe what wasn't seen in the original piece. And there's an image of it built, so you can see the fabrics across from each other, and we're lying on our backs with our arms, passing through this little grid that keeps us in frame. So we're blind of each other's movement too. We have to just trust that we're in perfect unison. So you can imagine just how studied this piece was. It was more difficult than any choreography I ever performed in. Um, this is the installation of it in one exhibition and another at Starry Brovar in Poznan. Let's dance. I worked with students in the research process um, in Starry Bro at Starry Brovar um, a year prior. So it wasn't until a year later that Mindy and I worked out this piece. Um, we were just kind of investigating the possibility and I'd really love to see this piece in a whole field of hands like this sometime. <clears throat> I'm gonna skip through this uh, work to just talk about two other works here. This is called Forehand Draw. This is a new work that I created here in my residency. Um, I do want to forewarn you that the sound of it is pretty intense, um, but I am working in a really sort of rational state. Um, and so just kind of relax in your viewership of it. It's just a segment of what is a 20 minute piece. Um, and I'm excited to test it out and maybe hear some response. But it, the title really explains it. It's the um, ability to leverage sound. And so it really shifts pitch based on where sensation is in my body. And I'm trying to attach that to every single in and out breath for 20 minutes. And so I'm trying to keep um, the projection of sound alive until what is felt um, that the heart becomes really tender, um, but as an object, so that there really is no subject or content. Um, it's just this sort of heightened state. It's a little preview, and I'll be exhibiting this in our Grant Wood exhibition.
just want to show you from a recent exhibition this last winter, and then we'll finish up here. Thanks for your patience. I was um, thinking about creating drawings that occupy spatial depth. And traditionally, we experience drawing on a wall from one vantage point, but what it would feel like kind of the ph phenomenology of being able to step inside of a drawing and to experience it, um, feeling the momentum of the lines kind of moving away from your own physical body. Um, and these are all themed from um, some research where I'm collecting gestures from um, just kind of sensitive images um, from media, uh, things that um, kind of collect in the memory that I've gone back to and um, create this series of counter gestures where I'm looking at where the sort of tension is in the hands of um, a person in an, an extreme state or, or in a, a situation where they're suffering. Um, and looking at where the tension is as, um, and framing it with my own hands as kind of a, a, a signal of support. And so this whole series is uh, a continued gesture toward um, something, an idea pertaining to these subjects. And I'm um, looping these gestures into, you know, so creating a choreography that um, loops and performing it in space, inside of a space, and then running rope string across the space in order to land the coordinates. And I, want to, I wanted to make a drawing where the paper arrived to the graphite instead of the graphite arriving to the paper. And so I'm working kind of backwards with building these provisional kind of structures or sculptures that arrive to where the action is and then fill it with a lot of other material, foam and plaster and resin, uh, well, a, a plaster made resin and then cut the ropes. And so you see the ropes kind of dailing from, from the piece and then um, facing it with uh, this kind of rampage of, of um, paper mounted aluminum that becomes my drawing surface. So this whole backwards process um, of trying to draw spatially. And the idea is that I can continue to perform these works. So after they're performed and installed, I could go back to them that the gesture and the effort and the intention of the piece is to keep coming back to it. Um, as long as I can, so that that choreography continues to stay alive and stay with me. I'll show you one last moving image here to finish. So a continued gesture toward our ability to provide sanctuary. Looking at a lot of images of migrants from US and European borders. And so there's no time for it. I, I don't know how long I perform this, um, possibly a couple hours, but it's just really about sinking into the piece and, and trying to stay really alert and really represent what's behind um, these gestures of support. And, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tony. That was wonderful. And I hope that the audience has enjoyed hearing you discuss your practice. I hope all of you will come and visit the exhibition if you're in the Atlanta area. Again, This Mortal Coil, which includes work by Tony Arrico, is on view through December 11th at the Zuckerman Museum of Art. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing you at the museum.